We'll see if our children are hanging out, running around. We, we will, we're going to see if they're going to take off. And I think I think they're going. Um, I love it. I, I was smiling this morning. We had I think three or so in the four, three or four in the uh, preschool area. Friday, we had a couple, one specific child here Friday afternoon and, um, and with a family meal and that child was doing everything he could to find something to do and the parents went back and brought out about four different uh, toy vehicles, fire truck, police car, bulldozer, and I, it was a little girl so I was sort of trying to entertain her and smile and everything. I just looked at the grandparents and said, I'm sorry, we got boys that play back there a lot, of, quite a bit, so the bulldozer and the trucks and that stuff's out there I said and and the little girl back there she loves to color and she's just content as can be a lot of times but the boys are a little they're a little bit rambunctious sometimes so um, I think they're like their grandpas I, I don't know um, but I'm, I'm thrilled to have these um, these preschool children around I, I love teaching the student class on Sunday mornings and so uh, I, I love to hang around the children Thank you for that. If you've got your Bibles with me this morning, Acts chapter 25, uh, we're in a series of messages called Encounters. We're in the second encounter of Paul's life at the end of his life. Uh, sort of, we'll move to that point and just give you that um, scenario to begin with. Uh, last week, we dealt with a procrastinating politician, a guy who was presenting evidence, trying to uh, sort of have a trial for that of Paul, uh, a defense that was brought before Paul that was irrefutable, uh, knowing he was innocent, fully knowing he was innocent. Uh, 400 plus men in security detail. And I, I'm, I'm like, that's pretty cool. I just, I, I still like that idea of a few hundred men um, security detail uh, for Paul. And, and so he was, he was escorted safely. Um, and then we got to the end of that and this procrastinating politician just said, you know what, I'm gonna keep you around and we'll just see what happens. And he missed the opportunity of eternity because of his earthly decision. Um, so we come to encounter number two in Acts chapter number 25. If you are able and willing, if you stand with me for reading God's word, a narrative, uh, these 12 verses, uh, Acts chapter number 25. The Bible says, now when Festus was come into the province after uh, three days he ascended from Caesarea to Jerusalem. Then the high priest, chief priest, informed him against Paul, besought him, and desired favor against him. He would send him to Jerusalem, laying wait to kill him. But Festus answered that Paul should be kept in Caesarea. He himself would depart shortly thither. Let them therefore say, He which among you are able to go down with me, and accuse this man if there be any wickedness in him. And verse 6 When he had tarried among them, more than 10 days. And he went down to Caesarea. The next day, seeing in the judgment seat, commanded Paul to be brought. When he was come, the Jews which came down from Jerusalem, they stood round about, laid many grievous complaints against Paul, which they could not prove. While he answered for himself, neither against the law of the Jews, neither against the temple, nor yet against Caesar, have I offended anything at all. But Festus, Willing to do the Jews a pleasure. He answered Paul and said, Will thou go up to Jerusalem and there be judged of these things before me? Paul said, I stand at Caesar's judgment seat where I ought to be judged. So the Jews have I done no wrong, as thou very well knowest. For I be an offender or committed anything worthy of death, I refuse not to die, but... If there be none of these things whereof they accuse me, no man may deliver me unto them. I appeal unto Caesar. And Festus, when he conferred with the council, answered, Hast thou appealed unto Caesar? Unto Caesar shalt thou go. May God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated this morning. When I was a student in high school, uh, the whole discussion was, what are you going to do with your life? And uh, one of the things was uh, a doctor. And I realized doctors have to go to school way too long. 
they're around sick people a lot, and I, I don't I don't like a lot of I didn't want to go to school the rest of my life, and I don't like being around sick people. And I don't don't take that offensively. I'll come visit you in the hospital if they let me, but I just I, I just not the job I wanted. And then I thought about this was a pretty cool thing. I thought about being a lawyer. Um, I can argue with anybody. I mean, it's just again, you know, it, it's. I, Sandy, go ahead and pop up that attorney slide there. Yeah, yeah, I can argue with anybody. I'm like, and I promise you, as a teenager, um, I don't know why my mouth didn't get popped. Mama did it. But I don't know why other people didn't just just haul off and smack me. I had a smart out of mouth, and it carried over in my young adult years. And fortunately, the Lord has allowed me to sort of control it a little bit better. I still say stupid things. My wife will vouch for that. Uh, but I thought about being an attorney because. I get to argue to defend somebody or argue to prosecute somebody. And, and so I did. I remember looking at a college catalog. And those things were thick back in those days. Everything's online now. This paper college catalog. And I was like, what would it take for me to be a judge? Get to the attorney thing, and I want to be a judge. I want to just sort of rule. And you know, I, want to, I want to be in charge, you know? And so I did, I looked at it, and, and you, you get your undergrad bachelor's degree, and then you get what's called a JD degree, a Juris Doctorate. Um, you get a master's, then you get this JD degree, and you finally become an attorney, and then you can work your way up to being elected as a judge, and, and you get to rule over all these things. And I'm sitting there thinking, that would be pretty cool. Um, I get to rule, I get to judge, I've got somebody over here, I've got a bailiff in my courtroom, that in a moment's notice, I can put somebody in jail? This is pretty cool. Um, until I realized that judges have more death threats on them than any other position in America. And you're like, really? Well, there's a bunch of judges, and evidently they're dealing with a bunch of criminals. And I was like, yeah, I'd rather not have a bunch of death threats. Um, I'm already a pastor in church. That's, that's wonderful. No death threats yet. Y'all, again, and so I decided the whole attorney thing, the judge thing, no. I, it's just, so where can I control things? I'm like, I can be a teacher. So I did. I, you know, I, I started teaching and, and enjoyed that side of things. Here, here's encounter number two for Paul. First time he was in a courtroom setting, um, we get it. It was Felix. Felix just sort of was like, okay, I'm going to put you under house arrest. This time, I'm a guy by the name of Festus. And when we say Festus, I know some of you thinking gun smoke. I know it. I got it in mind. I, I thought it too. It's not gun smoke Festus. Um, this, this is this is ruler of a province over the Jews, military Festus. This guy is on top of things. And so he comes to rule. And it's been two years since Paul has been under house arrest. And as the new ruler, Roman appointed ruler, he's got to make the Jews. Well, he's got to appease them. He's got to deal with the Jews. Uh, the Jews are under Roman authority. And so if the Jews will cooperate, his rulership will be great. But if the Jews cause him problems, his rulership is going to be a problem itself. And eventually, the Jews are going to stir up so much problem that they're going to be destroyed just in a few years from when this is happening. But I haven't got there yet. So he wants to make peace with the Jews. He goes to Jerusalem to meet with the chief priests. He meets there three days, and in three days, chief priests are like, we got to kill Paul. We've got to be done with him. If you'll just bring him to us, we've got this assassination plot ready. We already tried it one time, but he got like 400 people guarding him. But we got this assassination thing. It, it's in place. If you will transport him to Jerusalem, we'll kill him. We'll kill him. We won't have to worry about him going through the court system. And so here's, here's Festus. His first real decision as governor, and he meets with the chief priests, he meets with the people that have some power of the Jews, and they say, well, here's our assassination plot. We want to kill Paul. Now here's what Festus did know. I'm going to put it out there. He knew about Pilate. He was very well aware of Pilate. He knew about Jesus. He was very well aware of what happened in history with the death and crucifixion of Jesus. He understood that Pilate 
possibly and pretty much gave his life to Christ after that fact. And when Pilate got saved, that the Jews erupted even more, and they had to have a military force come in. And Festus knew the history. He was very well in the history. He knew it. Very well aware of it. So now he's meeting with the chief priests. He spends three days with them. He says, okay, guys, here's what I'm going to do. As ruler, the courtroom is in Caesarea. I'm going to hang out with you a little bit. You get your witnesses together. You get all your accusations. You get them all together. And you can come with me to Caesarea. And I'll hear everything in the courtroom setting. So here's what happens. The assassination plot is foiled. They're trying to kill him. If you just bring Jerusalem, we'll kill him. Nope, not going to do it. Here's what we will do. We'll go to Caesarea and we'll have this court case. And the Bible says that they spend 10 days. Now, what do you think they were doing for 10 days? Let me, let me fill in the blank. Um, he was staying at the best castle there was in Jerusalem. He was having the best meals he could have in Jerusalem. He had the best entertainment he could have in Jerusalem. He was pampered. He was catered to. He was bribed. Everything was put before him as the new governor that we want you to listen to us as Jews. If you'll do this for us, we'll be okay with you. And now as this politician, he's got to make a decision. Am I going to cave to the Jews or am I going to uphold Roman rule? He's a Roman citizen. Everything he's been taught and understood as a Roman military man is to hate the Jews. Everything the Jews have been taught is to hate the Romans. Uh, Jesus told them in the Gospel of Matthew, Sermon on Mount, he says, hey, if, if someone wants to go one mile, go with them two miles. And if you study that scripture out, and I probably have preached that here before, it was a Roman soldier that could come up to any Jew at any point in time in his house and say, hey, you need to carry my stuff. And that Jew had to drop what he was doing. He had to pick up the stuff off the ground and carry it with him one mile. And every Jew marked the mile from their house. They get to the end of the mile, they drop the stuff and walk off mad. They just lost an hour of their day. And then they had to go with a Roman soldier at that. And Jesus says, hey, let's be different. Let's not worry about that mile marker. Let's entertain the guy. Let's talk to the guy. Let's get the first mile and say, hey, man, if you got another mile, I'll walk with you. Let's offer the guy some water. Let's present the love of Jesus Christ to that Roman soldier. Oh, the Jews didn't get it. Few of them did. There was only a handful at the cross of Christ. They didn't get it. They hated the Romans. The Romans hated the Jews. So now here's Festus. Assassination plot. It's there. Is Festus going to let the Jews have control and power and give in to them their first request? Or is he going to hold back and say, you know what? I'm the governor. I'm going to rule. The plot is there. He says, here's the deal. I'm going to hang out with you about 10 days. We're going to go in and we're going to hold this court case. And sure enough, they all travel to Caesarea and they get down to the coastline on the Mediterranean Sea, a beautiful area. Courtroom drama is getting ready to happen at its finest. And it has been two years. Now, I want you to think about that for two years. Paul has been under house arrest for two years. If you've been arrested, you know your court trial date is coming. What do you do? Well, you probably try to find an attorney. Um, you want to meet with your attorney. You want to discuss your defense of what you've got to defend yourself. You've got to discuss the witnesses you want to help you defend yourself. You've got to build your court case as best you can build your court case. And you've got to know everything about what's getting ready to happen in this court case. Blessing to God, I've never been arrested, never had to go through a court trial, but I have been on the jury side of things. First time I sat on the jury, I was like, Lord, I really don't want to do this. I really don't want to do this. Lord, I appreciate you getting me out of this. He said, okay. I was like the sixth person called. I'm like, Lord, what's, what's the deal? He didn't answer my prayer. So I went up and tried to give the preacher's bill. Guys, you really don't want a preacher doing this. 
And they're like, what? You mean we can't trust a preacher? I'm like, really? You can't trust me, but you don't want me doing this. Yeah, we do want you doing it. Really? You don't want me doing this. Yeah, yeah, we want you doing this. I'm like, hmm, didn't get out of it. So I did the preacher thing. I wore a coat and tie every, every day, six days on the jury trial. We get to the end of the jury trial. We go back in our little room, and, and we start discussing things. First thing, they have to pick a foreman of the jury. Guess who they picked? The guy who wore a suit every day. So now I'm the jury foreman. I'm like, really, Lord? I didn't want to do this to begin with. You're putting me in this case. And so we started discussing the case. And I said, hey, let's stop. Let's just vote right now. Let's see what we come up with. And I was praying. Oh, I was praying. I was praying. Let these people vote the way I know is right. I mean, I know it's right. You got to make sure they vote with me. So I remember, I do. We were voting on two things. First card came up, person voted just like me. I'm like, cool. Second card came up, it was my handwriting. Like, man. Third card came up, some, some guy on our jury decided to vote yes on one and no on the other. And I'm like, you idiot. I mean, that was my first thought. What are you doing? And then, and then one person voted against me, and then all the other nine voted with me. So here it was. We had ten persons with me, because I was right, I knew I was right. Um, I had one person totally against everything, one person was split. And so then we started the discussion. Eight minutes later, we're like, okay, we're done. Let's just, let's just make sure our verdict is clear. Here's what we found out. Because they couldn't tell us everything about the case. They, they just told us our part of the case. We found out that this guy had already been um, in one court case with the same setting. And... Um, they decided they were going to attack him. They already sued one person or one. They were going to go after him. And for three years, this guy had a defense team for him. For three years. And the prosecution, for about a year and a half, put a case against him. And they made him out to look bad and ugly. And the, the, the defense team made him out to be good and great. And it was all said and done. We're like, listen, this guy's innocent. Y'all are just trying to get some more money. And, and, and so we declared his innocence. But for a moment, it was like, what is going to happen here? Here's what Paul does for two years. He writes one letter. He's encouraging Titus, pastor, Crete. And he gives him this manual saying, Titus, this is what you need to do to continue your ministry. This is what you need to move on. And he prepares his own defense for this trial. He's prepared to walk into this trial. And so as the assassination plot didn't work out, he comes to trial, and here comes the accusations one more time. Uh, look with me in, in God's Word, verse number uh, 6, chapter 25. It says, When Festus had tarried among them ten days, he went down to Caesarea, the next day sitting in the judgment seat, command Paul to be brought and when he was come, the Jews which came down from Jerusalem, they stood round about. They laid many and grievous complaints against Paul, which they could not prove. Well, what were those many and grievous complaints against Paul? Well, if we go back to chapter 24, um, the complaints in verse 5 and 6 said that we found this man a pestilent feller, a mover of sedition among all the Jews throughout the world. He was a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. He had gone out and profaned the temple, um, and we took him to judge him according to our law, but, you know, Claudius took him and, and hid him and protected him, and we would have judged him, we would have stoned him to death, but we don't have that opportunity. And so they lay all these complaints before him again, and they present all these different accusations. Let me, let me carefully say this, because I preached on this last week, and I don't want to belabor the point today, but people are going to accuse you, people are going to attack you, and it depends on how you come out the other side if you win. It's your character, it's your integrity, it's your well-being, and how you live will determine how this comes out the other side. He is writing a letter to Titus. Let me, let me go ahead and tell you, when he starts off writing a letter to Titus, he gives Titus the commands of pastors of how they should live their life, and one of them is to be blameless. Well, pastor, if somebody blames you, then you're not blameless. You're exactly right. And so when you study out the word, it's not that you just don't get accused because people are going to accuse me. 
They're going to accuse me of pride today because I wanted somebody to thank the pastor for mopping up the floor in the bathroom. They're going to accuse me of not being humble because I was mopping up the floor in the bathroom and told everybody about it. I, you, know, you get accused, but when, when it comes out, are you blameless of the accusation? Are you blameless? And so here's Paul. He's doing everything he can for the Lord, doing it the right way, as best we can tell. The only laws he may be breaking, he's not doing it in this case, is laws that are against God's will, against God's word. And may I suggest to you, if, if you've got the conviction to stand up for God's word and man's law is contrary to God's word, stand on God's word. I'll just make that very clear. And so that's, if there's a law that's breaking, that's the only thing. But it's not in this case. He's not breaking the law. He's not. The accusations come against him. And I love what the Bible says with no proof. Absence of proof. Did you see that preacher? He was in food line last night. He pushed his wife out of the way and went and hugged a young black woman. Did you see him do that? Anybody see that, by the way? I did see some church members. My wife saw it. Yeah, she's like, yeah, you did. You just sort of pushed me away or whatever and, and hugged Lenore. Yeah, uh, you know, I just can't believe he just pushed his wife out of the way like that. So now you accuse me of abusing my wife. I wasn't abusing my wife. Uh, yeah, you, you, you get all these crazy. And when it, bottom line, it was all settled down, said and done, it was finished. He's innocent. No proof. No proof. Let me, let me tell you in life, if you get to the point where someone accuses you and there's no proof, you can smile. But let me tell you this, it's probably not done. It's probably not done. They're going to come at you another way. They're going to attack you another way. They're going to challenge you another way. They're, they're going to keep coming after you. And here's what happens with Paul. I don't want you to miss it. Festus listens to everything. The Bible says there's nothing of this Verse number 9. Festus, willing to Jews a pleasure. He answered Paul and said, Hey, will you go up to Jerusalem and be judged of these things before me? Interesting. We go from no proof, the absence of proof, the assassination plot that was there, the accusations that were presented, the absence of proof, and now there is another plan that's in the works. Well, Paul, do you think you'd go up to Jerusalem with me? Paul's sitting there thinking in the back of my mind, if I go to Jerusalem, I'm dead. They're going to kill me. They're going to get me on the way. Claudius Lysias, he sent 400 guards with me and protected me. But I am not about to go in the Sanhedrin court, in the Jewish court of law, sit before the chief priests, the men that already tried to assassinate me, and, and let Festus rule over me because I won't even get there. Paul studied this thing out. Let me, let me suggest to you, just because you're blameless in one case, just because there's absence of proof in one case, it doesn't mean somebody's going to give up and they're going to quit bothering you. They're probably going to come at you stronger. They're probably going to come at you harder. And maybe the first case was a little petty stuff, and they decided, well, I'm going to... I'm going to up it up. I'm going to make it worse. I'm going to get hold of them. I am going to attack them ruthlessly. So now here's Paul. Paul says, no, 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 no. Verse 10, I am in Caesar's court. I'm in his judgment hall, and I'm going to stay right here. I'm going to be judged under Roman law. I'm a Roman citizen. You judge me right now. And if you're not going to judge me, I appeal to Caesar. Are you serious? Seriously. You're going to appeal to Caesar? He proposes his last ditch option. Acts 24. Felix determines he's innocent. Acts 25. Verses 1 through 12. Festus determines he's innocent. Neither governor had the guts to release him and free him. Neither one of them. He says, you know what? Send me to Caesar. 
Send me to Caesar. I appeal to him. As a Roman citizen, I have the right to see Caesar. It's my right. Interesting. Why would Paul want to go to Caesar? Let me just tell you who Caesar is when Paul does this. It's a guy by the name of Nero. If you know anything about history, Roman history, Nero will become one of the most brutal Roman emperors in Roman history. He will take Christians that announce their faith in the Lord. He will tie them to a stake in his gardens outside the palace. He will pour wax on them and light them on fire so he can see his garden at night. That is just the tip of Nero. Paul says, you know what? I'll take them on. Send me to Caesar. You and I would say that's crazy. Absolutely crazy. But not in God's plan. Not in God's plan. You see, it, it's, and I've got the verse on the screen. It's Acts chapter 23, verse 11. When Paul was first arrested, he goes to bed that night and he's praying. The Lord tells him in Acts 23, verse 11, The night following, the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul. I want you to be excited about this. For thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou hear witness also of Rome. Paul, I'm going to put you in Rome. I'm going to get you to Rome. And you are going to present the gospel message in Rome. When you get there, you're going to write a book or a letter called Romans. <laughs> you're going to present the gospel so clear to the Romans that they are going to have the option of Jesus Christ and you are the person that's going to get to go to Rome. And Festus doesn't realize that he's doing what God wants him to do. <laughs> Festus is like, what? You want to appeal to Caesar? You want to go to Rome? And so the Bible says, it gives us this dialogue, and Festus leaves the courtroom area. He goes and consults with whatever leadership is over there. And he has this private discussion. And the private discussion is, it's a Roman citizen. Man, we got to send him to Rome. We don't have a choice. If they actually appeal to Caesar by law, we got to let him go. And Festus is like, but man, this guy's innocent. If he would have just left us alone, we could have freed him here. But he appealed to Rome. Now we're sort of stuck. And they're like, you are stuck, Festus. You've got to send him to Rome. Oh, my goodness. Really? i got to send him to Rome? you got to send him to Rome. I don't want to send him to Rome. Why don't you want to send him to Rome? Well, then it looks like I'm not doing my job. I don't want to send him. Festus, you got to send him. Festus walks back into the courtroom. For all imagination purposes, he has to come back in there with doubt in his mind, but strength in his voice. You have appealed to Caesar. To Caesar, you will go. And that's all the Bible records. Festus is sort of out of the picture after this. And as pushy as he was being, desiring everything he could to get Paul just be innocent. Paul says, no, I'm going to push your buttons back. I'm going to say, you know what? I'm going to go to Rome. I want to imagine, and I can't prove this, I want to imagine that Paul says, you know what? Festus, don't worry about this thing. God told me I was going to go to Rome. Todd told me I, God told me I was going to be a witness there in Rome. Um, God told me I was going to get there. He just didn't tell me the government was going to pay for it. He didn't tell me he was going to give me room and board. Didn't know he was going to put me on a ship and get me there. Didn't know he was going to handle all my expenses. Didn't know he was going to have me under house arrest. I was going to have, not only am I going to travel to Rome, I'm going to have a guard with me the whole time taking care of me. Man, this is going to be easier than I thought. So, so here's, here's where I wrap this up. Uh, I want you to get this. Paul prays to God and says, hey, really do want to spread the gospel message. God says, you know what? I'm going to get you to Rome. I'm going to let you do that. I'm going to get you there. 
He didn't tell him all the details. Didn't tell him how it was going to work. Didn't tell him he got to sit in jail for two years before he starts his journey to Rome. He just gives him these two encounters to prepare him to take the gospel message to Rome. So here's, here's my challenge sort of to us in this setting. Do you have a plan to share the gospel someplace? Where do you want to go with the gospel message? Here, here's, what I, here's what I've learned. And I'm, I'm not being rude. I'm not being ugly. I'm not I'm not kind of, I don't want you to take all this wrong and mad and the preacher's just fussing and complaining. It's nothing like this. Here, here's what I know. Most of you every morning get up with a plan. Sometimes your plans change. Maybe going to work, maybe planning your grocery run, maybe errands, maybe visiting people, maybe whatever your plan is. You've got a plan every day. When was the last time your plan was to share the gospel of Jesus Christ? Preacher, I'm going to be lost with you. I haven't had that plan in a long time. Preacher, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know. I've never had that plan. Preacher, I'll be honest with you. I had that plan one day, but I got sidetracked. Preacher, I just let the Holy Spirit convict me, and when He convicts me to share the gospel message, then that's what I do. Just just whenever that opportunity might work out. And I'm going to tell you, I'm just going to be honest, none of those things work. I'm not going to tell you the Holy Spirit can't do that, but I'm going to tell you, if you don't have a plan in your life to share the gospel message, you won't do it. You plan to eat, you plan to sleep, you probably plan to watch TV, you plan to do whatever, but we don't plan to share the gospel message. Here's Paul, he says, you know what? I want to go to Rome. And God says, sure, I'm going to send you to Rome. I'm going to give you armed security. You're going to get to Rome, and you're going to share the gospel message. And we as a church are commissioned. We are challenged. We are sent out to take the gospel to the end of the world. And all I'm doing as a church, leading this church, Lord willing, is to take the gospel message a couple miles down the road, to Mormon Road on May 1st. That's all I'm trying to do. And see what the Holy Spirit does. And see how the gospel message can change lives. Because if we'll come to a reality, we know the gospel message changed our lives. The problem is, we just forgot about it. We just forgot about it. So with your heads bowed with me as we go to a time of invitation. The gospel message. For Paul, it was important enough for him to spend two years in jail. For Paul, it was important enough for him in this encounter to say, you know what? I appeal to Caesar. For Paul, it was important enough for him to take on more encounters to get to Caesar, to present the gospel message in Rome. For Paul, he said, this is my life's work. Present a testimony for Jesus Christ. So what about us? Will you share the gospel message of Jesus Christ? conversation tomorrow. Will you share the gospel message of Jesus Christ? Your conversation Tuesday. Will you share the gospel message of Jesus Christ? May we be convicted to share the message of Jesus Christ. Lord, I come before you right now. Paul's challenged immensely he avoids the assassination. He avoids the accusations. Uh, through all of this, he avoids death at this point. And in a crazy courtroom setting, he appeals to Caesar, which is your perfect plan for him to share the gospel in Rome. May we have a plan to share your word. I ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen.